So just a bit on endodontically treated teeth. So the question we want to answer is, if a tooth has been root canaled, is it going to benefit from having a crown put over the top? Because remember, when you root canal a tooth, what happens? You hollow out the middle of it. So structurally, it's a little bit weaker, right? So um, what we can do is, or what's been done is, we take a large sample size of teeth, right, some of which had been root canaled, and a crown put on, and others had a root canal and didn't have a crown put on. And then we follow those cases over time, and we just take a look at the success and failure rates of the two, right? So if we find that um, a certain subset fails a lot, then that would lead us to conclude that maybe a crown would be beneficial. So they took this study by Sorensen, they took 6,000 patients from nine different dental offices that were endodontically treated um, over 25 years. So basically they went back to their private practice, looked at the charts, and then just picked out teeth, that all the teeth that had been endodontically treated, some recently, like a year ago, and some over a longer period of time, up to 25 years, right? And they broke them up into um, these categories. So they separated maxillary teeth from mandibular. So looking on the left side of that chart, um, you can see how they split them up based on the location of the arch. So maxillary versus mandibular, and also separated out by anteriors, premolars, and molars. Okay? So let's focus on the right side of this chart. So up at the top, you'll see coronal coverage. So out of those teeth, some of them were crowned, and some of them didn't get crowned. And as they went back and looked at um, their charts, they just put it in one of two categories. Either the tooth survived or there was a success, or there was some significant failure that they listed down in a failure. Okay, So, for example, maxillary anterior teeth, there was a number of them that were crowned, about 300-ish. 273 of them were successful, and 39 of those had failed, and they broke those up into percentages. So you would say that about 87% of the maxillary tiers that were crowned were successful, and about 12% failed. And then they did a similar thing, and they looked at the teeth that didn't get crowned. And then they went through and they compared the two percentages. So there are certain trends that you should note, right? So if you look at all the posterior teeth, so premolars and molars, both in the maxillary and the mandibular arches, you can see a pretty significant difference between the success rates of teeth that were crowned and those that were not crowned, right? So maxillary premolars, we see that 94% of them succeeded and 56% failed that weren't crowned, okay? So you go down the list, this is 88% versus 50, and then 93 versus 62, okay? So pretty significant. But if you look at the anterior teeth, we see that there's no statistical difference between teeth in terms of success rates, whether they were crowned or not crowned, right? So the conclusion that we can draw from this um, study and our recommendation um, here at the school is that any posterior tooth, tooth that has been root canaled gets a crown, a buildup and crown put on top of it, okay? Because we can point to this study and say that this tooth is going to benefit long-term um, in terms of survival if it has been covered uh, with crown, so full coverage restoration. The anterior teeth, though, it doesn't appear that there's an increase in success rate. So really the determining factor for whether a anterior tooth needs a crown is just the amount of remaining tooth structure left, right? So let's say you had root canal treated a maxillary incisor and kept that access extremely conservative. And there was no previous filling, let's say. It was endotreated because maybe it got traumatized when you're young and it finally kind of gave out. So minimal destruction to tooth structure because we kept the access hole conservative and no previous filling, well, you're probably okay just covering up that access hole with some composite, 
you don't need a crown, right? Because the studies show that wouldn't benefit that much from full coverage. On the other hand, if that tooth had been, you know, gone through a series of class three and then class four restorations, and let's say a bulk of that tooth is now build up or composite material, then, and it got root canaled, then it'll probably benefit from some full coverage restoration. Okay. So the principle is um, coronal coverage for anterior teeth did not significantly improve the rate of clinical success for maxillary and mandibular teeth. You can fill that in and say, well, the uh, posterior teeth did significantly improve. Okay. So know that study. These are the conclusions. Uh, the other thing that they tested for was the presence of a post. So did a post help reinforce that tooth? Meaning, did it make that tooth stronger? And then if you look through the chart again, you would find that it did not make a significant difference. So some people thought that if you put, you know, since it's hollow, if we fill the tooth, the canal with a post, would that make it stronger? That was one of the thoughts. And then based on this study, we conclude that a post does not reinforce the tooth. Remember, what the, what's the purpose of having a post? It's merely to retain the core buildup, okay? So it functions as a retention for a core buildup. Okay, so that's a little summary of that. What's the purpose of the post? To retain the core buildup. It does not reinforce the tooth. In fact, some would say it actually decreases its strength because you put a lever arm onto the inside of that canal that may cause it to fracture, okay? Questions about that? Okay. Uh, fixed partial denture, so FPD, also known as a bridge. Um, basically, to summarize that, it's if you had a tooth missing, this is a way in which we can replace a missing tooth, right? So here's the um, glossary's definition of it. also known as a bridge to your patients. Right? In our class, we'll call it an FPD, so you sound more like a dentist. Okay, so here's just some uh, vocabulary or some terms you gotta know. Um, so the pontic, we'll start with that. A pontic is, you can think of it as the dummy tooth or an artificial tooth, right? It's the tooth that you're trying to replace. The retainer is the crown that goes on to the tooth and it's connected to the pontic. And that connecting area we'll call the connector. The tooth that is used to support this bridge is what we call the abutment tooth. Okay. So pretty straightforward, just some definitions you gotta know. Pontic, abutments, retainer crown, connector, and you can throw a dentulous ridge there. So one of the guiding principles that we have um, as to, well, how long of a bridge is too long, right? Because at some point you gotta ask, okay, can I replace one tooth pretty easily? Probably. How about two teeth? How about three teeth? So if you have three pontics, is your two abutment teeth gonna support a span that long? All right, so now we just get into some engineering principles is, you know, the longer the span is, then the more potential for flexure or um, maybe overloading of the teeth, right? So somebody came up with this idea, Ante's Law. Actually, this guy named Ante. This was done probably in the 1900s, so before any kind of evidence-based dentistry was around. But he came up with this sort of conclusion. I'm going to kind of rephrase this definition. We'll simplify it, but basically, if you added up the root surface of the abutment teeth, he postulated that that surface area should be greater than the root surface of the area of the missing teeth, right? So one example, or let's just demonstrate, is if um, would a bridge from your canine to second molar be successful, right? So we add up the surface area of the abutment teeth. So 14 plus 22 gives us 36, right? And then if we added up the surface area of the root structure for the pontic, uh, the pontic teeth, what do we get there? 
45. Do that math right now. All right, so which, sur uh, which number is larger? The area, surface area of the pontic teeth, right? So this would be in violation of Ante's law. So that's sort of how that works. And the thought was the surface area of the abutment teeth should be greater than the teeth that you're replacing, okay? Um, so here's a little chart to just give you average surface area of an average, uh, like central or lateral. So you can kind of get an idea of um, the difference between the teeth. So if you wanted to do some math and figure out Ante's law, you could. All right? We would say Ante's law is just sort of a guiding principle that we use, uh, but there's not a lot of science behind it that proves that that's a good measure of whether a bridge will be successful or not, okay? Because we, um, some people have actually done studies and they've taken existing FPDs, right, fixed partial dentures that have been placed in somebody's mouth, or in people, patients' mouths. So here, here's a Scandinavian study. 60 fixed partial dentures were randomly selected. And then they looked at the function somewhere between five to eight years after placement. And they did the math, and they found that only five out of the 60 fulfilled this Ante's law. And they followed these restorations over time. All right? So if you look at this chart, the way to read this chart is, so this is a surface area of the abutment divided by the surface area of the pontics. So these are the root surfaces. And if, if it fulfilled Ante's law, you would expect this number to be over 100%. So here we see only five of those FPDs fulfilled that Ante's law, and the rest of them didn't by varying degrees. Okay? So it turns out that uh, only about 8% of these fixed partial dentures result in some sort of technical failure. So um, I guess the conclusion is that Ante's Law, though it's a nice guideline, um, you can probably get away with a little bit more, okay? All right, just a few other terms and things that you may see. So a traditional fixed partial denture has a pontic and then two abutment teeth that are connected by two connectors, right? Sometimes what you'll see is a single abutment tooth and a single pontic connected by just one connector. So we would call that a cantilevered pontic. So obviously this gives us the best scenario because you have a tooth on both sides of the opposing arch and then the force that you apply to that tooth is going to be shared between the two roots. On the flip side, if you had a cantilever pontic, well, it's only connected on one side, and then you have this um, force that ex is exhibited on the pontic that may have a higher incidence of dislodgement of this abutment tooth. So one of the few, um, you know, this, we don't really advocate for this type of cantilever FPD. Um, sometimes you'll see this on implants. So if you had a single implant instead of tooth, and we're cantilevering a small tooth, like a lateral, that may be appropriate. But the idea is that sometimes you don't want to touch the neighboring tooth. For example, what if this crown has already been root canaled and a crown, and there's not a lot of tooth structure remaining on it? Well, one may be hesitant to take off this crown and then subject it to more force. Um, so a compromise may be just hanging off a tooth off of the canine. Right? So there's different clinical situations where a cantilever uh, may be appropriate, but in general, we, I would say we're doing much, much less of these type of restorations, partly because we have a better, um, or we have other solutions for replacing a missing tooth, um, including a dental implant, which has kind of revolutionized or changed the way we treat an implant in a lot of these cases, okay? But just for definition, so you know what a cantilever is. So long-term prognosis is poor. Uh, forces are best supported uh, when directed along the long axis of the tooth. Okay? So generally, these aren't treatment plans at eyes, though. Uh, 
Um, so this was a study that just compared success and failure rates of teeth that were um, supporting a fixed partial denture or a removable partial denture. So you can see that they categorized, so they took about 1,200 teeth that were endodontically treated, and they had four categories, either no crown, just a tooth by itself, a single crown, or they use it as an abutment tooth. And just to refresh your memory, I think we have, let's see, there's a little slide on it, yes. An RPD, so one of the reasons why a tooth may need a crown is to change the contours of the tooth. And that's this situation here where you want a uh, tooth to support a partial denture, and then the clasp of the denture is going to hug the tooth in a certain way to prevent this prosthesis from just falling down. So the idea is that if you didn't have this clasp here, gravity would just pull this denture downward and away from the tissue. So you want to customize the shape or the contour of this crown so that that clasp arm kind of hugs that tooth, right? So you're going to learn a lot more about this in a couple of weeks when you guys start your removal portion that's your course. Right. So just wanted to give you an idea of the uh, success rate for these teeth as you ask it to support more and more teeth. So a fixed partial denture, instead of the crown just supporting itself, it now has to take on some of the load of that pontic space. And then the same idea with partial denture. Instead of that crown just supporting itself, it's now going to take on the load of the denture teeth that are added onto it. Okay? So we can see that the success rate as you ask it to take on more and more load um, drops pretty significantly over time, or as you put more load. So a crown, they would say, it would only fail about 5% of the time. Once you subject it to asking it to support a pontic, it about doubles in terms of its failure rate. And then by the time you ask it to support multiple teeth in an RPD situation, then that jumps to 22%, okay? So a pretty straightforward principle, the more that you ask a crown to do or a tooth to do, more likely it's going to fail. Okay. So that just helps you put some numbers to these situations so you can kind of categorize it in your head. Because these are kind of little tidbits that you can um, share with your patients as you help treat and plan and explain treatment to them, right? Um, you can say, oh, since we're using that tooth as a um, bridge, to support a bridge, it's going to be twice as likely to have problems as if we didn't. So maybe that's why an implant would be beneficial, so we don't have to ask your neighboring teeth to take on the load. Alright, and then the second part of that study talks about uh, posts, whether a post was helpful or not. Okay. So in this particular study, they actually saw more failures um, or a decreased success rate when there was a post inserted. Okay. So, yeah, just a few things to know about those studies. Um, go ahead and read them um, before their quiz on Monday. All right. So let's talk about a fixed partial denture and the order of preparation. So the concept is you're going to prep both teeth like a crown, and then you're going to make, you know, a... Uh, provisional that just connects the two together. So the question is, are we going to start with teeth number 18 to 20 today, uh, with 19 being the pontic? So the question is, which should you prepare first, the molar or the premolar? Okay? Because you've got to get both teeth to have the same path of withdrawal. So remember we talked about not having undercuts on single tooth preparations. Right, what's the reason for not having undercuts? What problems would you run into if you had an undercut? So no path of withdrawal would lead to your wax step not being able to be removed. The same thing would occur when you try to make a provisional. It would get locked in into those undercuts. So instead of just having one tooth to worry about, you now have to look at them together as well. So each individual abutment needs to draw on its own 
But now also you got to look at the two path of insertions or withdraws of both teeth, and then they too need to follow the same path of withdrawal. Okay? So um, these abutment teeth tend to be more tapered than what you may be accustomed to doing just for the sake of getting both teeth in the same path. Yes? Right, yeah. So you can do it that way. You can have your other surf, like your facial surface, just start there. Yeah. Yep. So what you do want to do is line up, you know, um, you want you can do your depth cuts on each just to maintain the same angulation and carry that over to the other tooth. Okay. So the question is, which tooth would you want to start with first? And the answer to that is you rather start prepping the smaller tooth first because if you need to overcorrect the path withdrawal on the other tooth, you got more tooth structure to play with, okay? So let's say your premolar, when you first started prepping that, went a little bit awry. Well, you can go to your molar and then really exaggerate the amount of reduction there and still get it to draw, and you'll be further away from the pulp. You just have a larger tooth in which to make those corrections, okay? So the small tooth should be prepared first um, because if there's an error that is made in the path of insertion, it can be compensated by overprepping the second tooth. You'd rather overprepare a larger tooth than a smaller tooth. The other thing to think about too is, and I didn't put a slide in this, um, but I probably should have, is think about the path of, or the orientation of the teeth as you move from the posterior to the anterior. What do we know about how the teeth are oriented against each other? It goes from vertical to slightly angled, right? So let's say your Frick's partial denture starts to wrap around the corner, and let's say it goes to the canine or maybe the central, and you kind of wrap around from the posterior to the anterior. Well, you may need to over prep one of the teeth so you get those teeth to have draw. Whereas if you had uh, two posterior teeth, those are a little bit more straightforward because both are oriented just straight vertically, right? So if you think about the long axis of teeth, 18 and 20 are pretty much just straight up and down. But let's say you're doing canine from, let's say you're going from 11 to 13. Well, the canine starts to tip a little bit, okay? So the long axis of the canine isn't exactly straight vertical. All right, so just something to keep in mind as you um, prep these teeth. Okay, so path of withdrawal. So let's go over this concept again with some visuals here, right? So you have two abutment teeth, and we simplify the geometry. So we have some taper. So if they're, so both of the teeth individually have draw, plus they both have draw in relation to each other, right? So if you were to draw some lines here, we would see that we have no undercuts present. So if we did a wax up, or if we try to see a, or make a provisional, we would know that these have draw. Draw. Yeah. So you guys don't have the PowerPoint version, because you like to use that notability. All right, so we'll do the animation again, so you can see. Draw. <laughs> wow, you really like that one. <laughs> Let's keep going. <laughs> More? <laughs> whoa, whoa, whoa. Whoa. All right, we're having too much fun. All right, so you have draw here, right? So what if one of your abutment teeth was prepped so that um, it has an undercut? Now, if you draw your lines, you would see the presence of an undercut there. So this prosthesis would not draw. All right, so we're just basically expanding on that same concept of pathos insertion, path of draw, whatever, undercuts. You're just now applying it to more structures. So there's more walls to look at. So you would know that something like this wouldn't be able to be seated. Okay, it gets stuck there. Or if you had something made, it wouldn't be able to be withdrawn. Okay. <laughs> I'm sorry, too. <laughs> All 
but I'll get up now. <laughs> All right, so our teeth are spread out much further apart, right? So you can't see both teeth at the same time with your small mouth mirror. Um, so one thing that we'll have for you is a large mirror so that you can examine the teeth from different directions. And now you can see both abutment teeth at the same time to evaluate your path of withdrawal. Okay? Another little tool that we have for you, and we're doing this a lot more in the clinic now too, is wheeling out our little steric machine. Now we can scan the teeth. And remember, after you draw your margin, does anybody remember what step is next after drawing your margin? There's that path of insertion tool, right? And then you know if you have an undercut, what happens to that um, area that's undercut? You would see a little bit of yellow, okay? So what we're doing now is we would have you guys scan the preps when you think you got your path of withdrawal correct, and we'll go to that in path of insertion step and then see if there's any yellow, okay? So that's something we're going to have you guys do um, in the sim clinic here is after you're done prepping and you think you got it where you need it, okay? Um, and do this before you show your row instructor just so you have you can kind of think critically on your own is use that steric as an aid to see if you got that path of insertion between both teeth correct. Because if you can't find a path that doesn't have any yellow you know you got more adjusting to do and you got to taper one of the walls a little bit more. Question? Yeah, so the angulation of the anterior teeth, so if you're looking at me sideways, right, my molar would probably run straight up and down. And the canine is kicked out a little bit like this, right? So those two teeth, don't start off straight. One's like this, one straight up and down. So that means when you prep the two teeth, if you were to prep them, let's say individually, just along the long axis of the teeth, they wouldn't have draw. You would have to overcompensate one or the other to get a path of insertion. So there's the balance between, said you wanted to the Right, right. And then because of that. So you may have to over prep the molar just so you get it in the same path of insertion okay well you rather not i mean you can kind of split the difference but the problem with over prepping the anterior tooth is that you get closer to the pulp than you would with a posterior tooth all right fixed partial denture restorations what do we want to know about this all right, so if we go back to the slide, we obviously want it cleansable. We want to be able to clean around our provisional. Um, not ex excess pressure on the ridge. So mechanical requirements, you want it to be rigid. You don't want it to break, obviously. Strong connectors. So that connector area is the area that connects the abutment and the pontic. And that tends to be the thinnest area of our fixed partial denture. And then you obviously want it to look Fabulous, right? Should look like a tooth. All right, so let's focus in on our pontics. So here's a chart that lists all the different pontic designs that we had. And we'll go through each one individually, but there's a summary slide of it. Um, just a thing of notes, um, the Saddle ridge lap, you see the second one on that list that's not recommended. The modified ridge lap, so the second to last one is probably the one that you'll do the most of. And then the ovate pontic is going to be our best in terms of aesthetics. Right? And we'll do an exercise with that ovate pontic. All right, so just a guiding principle for these pontics. The idea of convex versus concave. So I'm looking at the area of the pontic that is going to be in contact or closest to the tissue surface. And what you want is a convex surface. And the reason for that is at some point, the patient needs to be able to slip floss in between the teeth and then underneath the pontic to 
flush out any food that's trapped in there. Okay? If you have a surface that's convex that floss, you're going to be able to adapt that floss along the convex surface and clean that out. Versus something that's shaped concave, you'll see that a piece of floss, even if you held it tightly against the tooth, and then you pulled up on it or pulled towards the tooth, there'd be an area of that pontic area where it wouldn't be able to be cleansed, right? Right. So one of the principles is who cares what the lingual surface of that tooth pontic looks like, because that's not going to show anyways. We're going to modify that so that it becomes cleansable. Thus, a modified ridge-like pontic. See how that works out. All right, so concave, bad. Convex, good. Okay, so tissues of the surface of the pontic should be con um, convex to allow for hygiene. All right, so another principle is if you look in between the teeth, we want to open up these embrasure spaces just large enough so that you can slip a piece of floss through. And there's a balance because if we make that embrasure space too tall, let's say, then what happens to your connector size? That gets thinner and it becomes weaker, okay? Um, so there's, at some point you want to stop the embrasure space. And each patient will, their amount of papilla present is gonna be different. Remember we went through the studies of what the distance is from the bone to the interproximal contact. That has an influence on the papilla, or the presence of a papilla or not, or basically whether there's a black triangle. So for your provisional FPDs, you do want um, some black triangle there to be able to slip your floss through pretty easily, okay? All right, so how do we get to this modified ridge lap shape? Well, one of the first things we'll do is we're going to use this large disc and start to open up the embrasure spaces to get that shape, okay? So we have a disc and open that up. Um, what we'll do is, um, in sim, um, since you guys love live demos, I got one set up for you. So I have not only a video of it, but also a live demo that we'll do, okay? So when we get back, um, in this demo, you can, I'll let you guys start working. So for those of you that want to sit and watch the demo, I'll just kind of be doing it in the background, okay? Um, so open up those embrasure spaces. And this is what the picture of a modified ridge lap looks like. So on the facial surface or the aesthetic area, it covers the, the ridge or it, it's well adapted to the ridge to mimic that tooth emerging out of the gums. But you could see it on the lingual side of that pontic it's shaped so that it is convex to allow for hygiene. So you're trying to get the best of both worlds, okay? So here is an area, if you think about this area of contact, that's the approximate area that should remain touching the tissue, right? Everything that's not in that area of contact should be contoured so that it flows um, into this convex shape or surface. Okay. And again, I'll show you a demo of what that should look like and how to contour it. Okay. So just to emphasize that point again, you can see that this piece of floss, even if you wrapped it tightly around the pontic, there's an area in that center there that is not cleansable. There's food that's going to be stuck underneath that piece. Okay. And I just marked with a pencil, so this area here you should leave relatively just untouched. Because okay, you want that area to be well adapted to the tissue surface so that um, it looks good, right? It looks like it's well adapted tissue and, and it's emerging from the tissue. And on the back side, you want to take a little burr and you want to start contouring that to get to that convex shape. Okay? So I have a skinny burr like that and I start holding it at that angle to have things sort of flow down into that space or into the interproximal region. So everything should be contoured to flow down. So the way you can think about it is if you like drops a little drop of water, is that water going to spread out and kind of flow down 
uh, onto floor, or if it's convex, it's the water is going to collect in some area of your pontic. Okay, so just think, are things going to flow down and away from that contoured pontic? All right, so you see how we've changed that convex surface into some, or concave surface into something that's convex, right? And same thing if we look in this direction from this view here, we can see that things are convex, not concave. Concave would be dished out this way. And we'll have some examples of what a concave pontic looks like. Um, so you do want that ridge lap area to be well adapted to the tissue so that um, these are both pontics. You can see because of the ridge deficiency here, you see how it's sunken in a bit that this doesn't look as natural because that uh, ridge lap area isn't well adapted to uh, the tissue surface and you get a little bit of shadowing there. Whereas on this surface here, it looks like a natural tooth that's emerging. The other thing you wanna focus in on is your ridge lap portion. You try to wanna match the um, height of the tooth as much as possible. Um, so that's what this picture shows. So a pontic should have the same incisal gingival height as the original tooth. Okay? So you just want to make it look as natural and try to keep the existing tooth height. So here's an example of an anterior tooth. So you can see that this facial portion is left relatively untouched. You can see a little space there for your floss to slide through. And then from the lingual surface, you can see how things are shaped. So it's convex, and this would be a cleansable pontic. Questions about modified ridge lap? Yes, Chris. What do you want me to stop? Yes, concave. Concave. How do we edit this? There, now it says concave. Good catch. Hey, any other mistakes? All right, ovate pontic. So the ovate pontic is um, different in the sense that it's, I don't know. It's just different. <laughs> just look at it. It's different. So the ovate pontic is uh, formed during the extraction of the tooth, uh, or you modify the tissue so it accepts um, this contour. Basically, it's, con it's still convex, but the whole thing is sort of pushing into the gum tissue area. Okay, So it has some displacement of that tissue. And this is the most um, natural looking pontic because it actually does emerge out of your gum line, okay? Whereas the ridge lap just kind of sits on top. Okay. So the idea is that you want this receptor site to be uh, one to 1.5 millimeters deep. And generally this is done in your most aesthetic areas. So really your uh, maxillary anterior teeth is where this is done most commonly. So here we see that the teeth have been prepped for crowns, and then um, the tooth is extracted. So we're trying to replace tooth number eight with this fixed partial denture. So you see we have a recent extraction site. This is the before of that tooth. And then you can see that that red line is where our free gingival margin is, and we have a portion of that pontic that's about one to 1.5 millimeters that will extend into that tissue area. So as that socket closes, the gum tissue is gonna heal around that contour. Okay. So let me just clarify, because I think the numbers. So this is a receptor site when you're finally restoring the tooth. And then what this textbook is getting at is on the day of extraction, you want that pontic to be a little bit deeper. So they say 2.5 millimeters there on the day of extraction. 
So once things start to heal, then they'll ask you to shorten that depth a bit. Okay, just to clarify. Right. So when you seed it, this is it seeded. That's where that red line is. Is at the gingiva. So the day of extraction, they want it a little bit deeper. Just a clarifying point. And then shorten it. Yeah, because this slide here depicts when you're ready to restore the final restoration. Right, receptor site one to one point five deep in the aesthetic area. Okay. Yes. No, because you you want the, the gum tissue to heal around that tissue. So the socket is way below that, right? The bone's going to fill in there. So remember, you have some distance between the top of your tissue to where the bone is, right? Generally about three millimeters. Remember when we say we sound the bone, there's sulcus, junction epithelium, and connective tissue. Um, so the purpose of extending it in is to uh, have the soft tissue heal around that contour. It's not going to affect the bone filling into that empty space there. Right, so you let that heal. Uh, four weeks after placement, pontic was shortened to extend 1.5 milliliters into the extraction site. So look at this pontic, right? Does that look really natural? So when you take off the FPD, the provisional, this is what the contour of that soft tissue looks like. So you're trying to mimic or recreate the contours of the tooth that was originally there. Okay. And then this is the final crown that's restored. So that's the idea of an ovate pontic. Okay. Uh, ideally done at the time of extraction. Um, sometimes what you can do is if the tooth's already extracted, you would actually take like, you'd numb up the patient, and then you would take like a round burr or a football burr, and then actually prep the tissue surface into this shape, and then add to the pontic so that you create this um, emergence profile, OK? So ideally done at time of extraction, but you can also do it after. But you have to kind of take away some of the tissue um, by essentially just grinding it with a burr, OK? All right, so just um, a slide about differing uh, ridge contours that you're going to see after extraction. Um, so this guy, Siebert, he came up with this classification. And I put this in because you may see this on your boards at some point. But class one is just a horizontal loss of bone. Class two is the vertical loss. And then class three is a combination of horizontal and vertical. Right? So nothing too groundbreaking there. The idea is that if you wanted, let's say you had a uh, vertical loss at class two, um, what you can do is to augment the aesthetics of this. You see how there's a soft, definitely a soft tissue deficiency there, where your pontic would be extremely tall to fill that space. You can augment that site by just adding a connective tissue graft to augment that soft tissue deficiency. Right? That's going to fill some of that bone loss that had occurred. Okay, so your soft tissue thickness there is going to be much thicker in other edentulous areas because you've added a connective tissue graft. Okay. Did you guys talk a little bit about that in your, at least grafting in your perio class? I didn't talk about like free gingival grafts. Okay, so it draws from that idea. Yes, Michelle. No, you can do it. I mean, for your class three, there's a limit to how much you can graft. But yeah, you can do it for any sort of soft tissue defect. Um, at some point, if like you have 10 millimeters to fill, let's say, it's pretty drastic. But you're not going to get all that with soft tissue. You have to actually add some bone before you put the tissue on the top. Okay. All right, so ridge lap. So we're going to go through the rest of the list. Uh, we went a little bit out of order from that second slide. But the ridge lap is a no-no. Uh, we don't ever do this. This is what you would have if you didn't, if you just pulled that provisional out of your little stents and then didn't contour it at all, it would have this shape here, right? So we know that this isn't cleansable. Okay, a sanitary or a hygienic pontic. Um, this is where it's just way off the tissue. You see, you can slip a whole like brush in there to clean 
in between. Right? So when you have that much space in here, it kind of doesn't matter what contour it is because you can physically slip like a brush or a bristle in there to clean everything out. Okay. Obviously, the aesthetics of this doesn't look very good, so they're generally uh, reserved for posterior teeth. Okay. So we don't see this done very often. The last thing we're going to talk about is a conical pontic. So um, you can see it's basically kind of like an ovate pontic, except it's just off the tissue, right? It's not really um, depressing the tissue to create that emergence profile. It just sits and comes to a point there. So one, it's cleansable because you've got a ton of space in the embrasures to slip things through. Uh, but it doesn't look like a natural tooth. So when you look at that emerging out of the gum line, you know, it looks like a cone. So disadvantage is aesthetics, but functional. Okay. So generally what we do is a modified ridge lap, um, or if it's an anterior study case, we'll try to do an ovate pontic. Okay. Um, and that's what we'll have you guys do in the sim clinic. So you're, we're going to do an FPD on number six through eight. And um, there's a manual chapter on how to uh, prep that <coughs> edentulous space for an ovate pontic. So as you guys get moving along in your projects, we'll probably stop here and go over that chapter uh, when a lot of you get to that anterior prep. Okay. Um, so these are minimum dimensions for your connector area. So this is primarily for your PFM. So you're going to have enough. So remember our metal, we have a metal substructure and then we have porcelain that's stacked on top, right? So there's a minimum dimension that we want of the metal substructure to have enough strength uh, for this. So for your posterior teeth, you can see how it's shaped, minimum three millimeters wide, two millimeters tall. And then for your anterior teeth, since they're contoured differently, it's just reversed, okay? Um, your provisionals that you make, you want to make a little bit, because two millimeters is not very wide, right? And then your bisacryl is actually pretty brittle. So you're going to try to maximize your connector dimension, but at the same time, you got to contour it so that you have a uh, embrasure space to get that floss through. So those are the two things you're trying to balance is enough room to slip floss in between the teeth, but don't remove so much so that your connector space is compromised. Because if your pontic's going to break, it's going to break in that connector area. All right, so when it comes to zirconia, so we tend not to do many all ceramic FPDs. We mostly stick to PFM. Because if you think about sort of the mechanics of a bridge, right, if you load the middle of that tooth, what happens to it? There's some flexure. But we know metal is pretty good, it can withstand that kind of force and that flexure. But where porcelain is weak, remember um, where, what, um, so what type of force is porcelain weakest at, or ceramic weakest at? It's in tension, right? So we say it's good in compressive strength, but it's bad in tension. So when you have a loading force right in the center of that pontic, you're going to have some tensile stress onto that tooth or onto that FPD. And with zirconia, um, you want to make sure you have a nice bulk of zirconia there to compensate or to withstand that tension force. So anyways, you're going to have, um, you're never going to see a metal FPD actually, the metal part actually fracture. You may see some of the porcelain chip off, but you know, you won't ever see metal fracture. However, a zirconia FPD, you may see that fracture at some point. So it's just a difference in material. So that's why we lean more towards the conservative side and generally do more um, FPD, uh, PFM FPDs, okay? In the anterior region, obviously, you have a little less force exerted on the teeth. That's when you're more likely to do a all ceramic expulsion venture. Um, Emax, generally, I would say, is not strong enough for a uh, fixed partial denture, unless you're looking maybe at the anterior mandible, right, where teeth are sort of the least, uh, takes on the least amount of stress there. Um, but that's rarely done, I would say. 
So if you're going to do something all ceramic, it's generally going to be the interior, and it's generally going to be with zirconia. So just a different requirement in terms of connector dimensions. So they have this rule of 27, where the height squared times the width um, should be greater than 27 millimeters cubed. Okay. So again, zirconia requires a bit more bulk to it for adequate strength. All right, questions about that? All right, cut and solder. So this is uh, probably the most confusing uh, topic we have, and this is what we're going to end uh, today's lecture with. So if there's one thing you pay attention to, uh, this should be it, because um, I think it's a challenging thing to kind of visualize, because you don't actually really get to simulate it at all. We have to do a little bit of imagination. All right, so this applies to uh, PFMs, because it involves metal. Right, you're not going to be able to cut through zirconia and solder it back together. Remember soldering? When else did we, um, is it advisable to solder? What do we say? And when you want to add interproximal contacts to some sort of metal restoration, right? So you take a little bit of this metal, you heat it up real good, and it basically just adds to that bulk there. Okay. So a metal framework is waxed up just like you would, you know, a PFM coping. It's casted. And you're actually going to try this metal coping into the patient's mouth. So you always want to have an extra appointment before the delivery appointment to try in this metal substructure. You want to do this before you add porcelain on top of it. Okay? Because if you didn't have this try-in, if you stack the porcelain and then you went to go deliver it and you find it doesn't fit, well, what do you have to do? You've got to strip all the porcelain and then do this cut and solder step anyways. So we always have a wax or a metal framework trying appointment for any of these uh, PFMs. And the same thing occurs if you do an all ceramic one. Um, you just wouldn't be able to cut and solder. You would, we would have to remake it. But we always have you guys do a trying appointment before the final porcelain is stacked on. Okay. So this metal framework is seated onto the preparation. And then what you're trying to do is check that it seats well. Right? You check the marginal seal, and then radiographs are taken to verify that it fits correctly onto the teeth. So there's times where the framework doesn't fit well. Okay? So there's some distortion and then somewhere, and then you get an open margin somewhere. Okay? And the question is, is this happening at the abutment level? Or the, you know, we can... I kind of want to classify these errors. You, know, you can think of it as like local errors, like right at the abutment or the margin, or a global error is like a distortion within the whole framework itself. We'll kind of clarify this point with uh, these diagrams here, okay? So is distortion at the local level or at the global level? And those are sort of loose terms that I use to help explain this. Okay. So if it doesn't fit, what can we do to test whether it's at the local level or the global level? Well, we can cut this framework and section it at the connector area, because that's where it's thinnest. Okay? And then we can seat the two individual pieces now, because now it's in two pieces, and we can seat it on the individual abutment teeth, so it's not connected anymore. So if we find that the marginal discrepancy still exists after we've sectioned it, then we know that you know the cast in the impression there was some inaccuracy there and that this framework needs to be remade right there's no way to get this framework to now seal the margin okay so this is an error at the local level you can think of it that way so new impression is needed um, because the margin was captured accurately thus no margin okay so here's another a different scenario let's say you cut cut this framework so it's now in two pieces, and then you go back and then seat it onto the preparation. And since they're in two individual pieces now, we find that, oh, both of the margins here are perfectly sealed. Right? So now we know that this error occurred at this global level, quote unquote, and this indicates that the margins are captured accurately, but the inner abutment relationship was distorted in some fashion, okay? 
Um, so in this situation, the framework doesn't need to be remade. It merely needs to be soldered together. All right, so let's illustrate that again, just for the sake of clarity. All right, so you have a framework that's made off of this cast, right? And then we go and try to seat it onto the patient's mouth. So we have this impression, it captured accurately. So we have our teeth, and we try to seat this framework onto the teeth. So you can see that the stone cast, if you look at the preps of the cast and the preps of the teeth, they're the same exact shape and size. Right? So we know that that captured it accurately. But the difference is the teeth may be, the relationship of the teeth is a little bit different. So on the stone, you can see where I drew that line. You see how the line isn't directly in the center of the tooth prep? So that means when we go seat this, what's going to happen? It's not going to fit because it's slightly askew, right? So that occurs when there's a difference between your cast and your teeth at that interabutment relationship. So not sort of at that global level, not at the local margin level. Okay. So the framework doesn't fit on the teeth because there's some distortion within that framework. So what can we do? We'll remove it, we section it, and now we go reseat it onto the teeth. So now we can see that the each individual piece seats perfectly. And then we're gonna add, remember that uh, acrylic that we added for our cast post and core? So that Duralay resin, so that acrylic resin is added to that gap to help just loop that together, okay? So that captures the correct interabutment relationship. So then we take that back out of the mouth, and we can send this to the lab where the lab will invest it, so that helps secure the two pieces in the same relationship. And then you take away the acrylic, and then you end up adding metal to it to join those two pieces together so that when you go back to the mouth the second time, that will fit onto the press. So that's the idea of cut and soldering a framework that doesn't fit. So I have a clinical example. Now this example is on implants, so you're gonna have to do a little imagination. Um, just pretend that the implants are like prep teeth, okay? So we tried in this framework, it's to connect two teeth here. It's supposed to be a splinted restoration and we see that there's a gap at the margin there. So what we do is we cut that framework in half. So you see where we cut it, and now we seat both of those two pieces individually. So you can see the margins are closed on both pieces, but then uh, they're only able to seat because we had cut them and they act as individual um, copings. So this is the acrylic resin that I'm talking about. So we added that intraorally while, while both are seated flush on the margins so that they're tied together. And then I don't have pictures of what the lab did, so I pulled these out of the textbook. But the idea here is you invest the metal, and you're, what you're trying to do is just preserve that relationship by putting it in some stone. And you see there's a gap there, a gap here. And what you do is you heat up this little piece of metal real hot, and then it's going to solder those two pieces together at that point. Okay, so then you rejoin the casting together. All right, so here's another example. Here's a piece of solder, you heat it real closely, okay? And then that binds the two pieces together. So now this has been soldered. Now we can seat it back into the mouth, and then we can see that there's no open margins on that, okay? So framework, uh, framework try-in, um, cut and solder if it doesn't fit. Um, and if the margins seal, then we know that it doesn't need to be remade, right? Does that make sense? So depending on what error you got, sometimes this cut and solder procedure can fix that error. There's times though where if the margin's not fitting because it's just not captured accurately, cutting and soldering isn't going to solve this marginal discrepancy. All right?